Well, thanks very much. Um, and thanks to you all for, for joining on this. Um, well, it's quite sunny here anyway today. Um, and thanks very much, Lorna. And on behalf of you know for ICANN uh, for organising um, this event, um, this is probably one of the most important places that you can be today in terms of the state of the planet and finding out the, the steps that we can take to do something to help. So I'm just going to go straight into screen share and get started. Um, just as a start, if you have questions um if you probably best if you can all stay on mute thank you and then if you have questions use the the chat or the or the, the chat um system and um and then i'll answer everything at the end otherwise it kind of makes everything too disjointed if we stop um as as i'm talking <clears throat> So here you go. So um, monitoring and measuring biodiversity for citizen science. And again, thanks very much to Lorna for organising it. And citizen science for biodiversity. Well, what is it? What does it mean? And, and why are we sitting here learning about it today? Well, the meaning of citizen science is research carried out by members of the general public to advance scientific knowledge. And essentially, it's encouraging everyone, you know, young and old, to start taking a, a more systematic interest in everything around us, um, to, to become scientists, to start thinking scientifically, and to start collecting information that we can collectively contribute to a central body. Um, and it's that kind of collection of information from all those different sources, from all the members of the public who are involved, um, which help us know what to do in the face of climate change. I mean, citizen science is not just being developed for climate change by any means, it's all kinds of areas, um, but probably one of the biggest problems facing us at the moment is climate change. And in order to be able to know what to do, um, we need the evidence. And it's impossible to collect sufficient evidence through paid scientists. And this is where everyone is calling on the public to um, start being scientists and start collecting that information. So another way the citizen science can be very interesting is it because you can find out who you are living alongside. And that's not just your human neighbors, but it's all the wildlife, it's all, all of nature around you. Uh, and also developing those scientific skills, those ways of thinking scientifically. You're developing skills in observation, patience, a mindfulness, interpretation, curiosity. And, you know, if all of us, if everyone in the planet uh, and everyone on the planet develop those kinds of skills, um, it would definitely be a better place. And it is a wonderful thing to be imparting to children these skills in um, observation and patience and interpretation, because it helps in all aspects of life. So, um, before we start talking about citizen science for biodiversity, it's really important to know what biodiversity means. Um, and, you know, again, if, if you're one of those people who thinks, actually, really, what does it mean? Um, am I really sure about what biodiversity means? You'll be joining millions and including myself, because um, biodiversity is a hugely complex subject. Um, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the meaning of it, because by, by understanding the meaning of it in its fullness, in its entirety, you can really begin to understand what it is to be monitoring and measuring biodiversity and what it is to be citizen scientists. So if some of you have seen previous talks, you've probably seen this slide several times before, and, and for that I apologize, but really this, this, this to me is one of the most fundamentally important pieces to be conveying. So um, biodiversity, it was coined in 1992 um, at the Rio Earth Summit, the, the, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it was held in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and leaders from all around the world convened together to talk about the protection of the world's natural resources. And their definition definition of biodiversity, which means it's just short for biological diversity, is all the species and types of planet organisms on the planet, plus their homes and environments, plus their interactions and relationships with one another. So it's not just 
biodiversity is not just one thing it's all these pieces held together now if that you're kind of sitting there looking at that and you're thinking well actually I'm none the wiser after that definition and I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about actually what that definition really means so what does all this what do all the species on the planet mean well you can google how many species on the planet and you'll come without with all kinds of variations um, but one of the most reliable is probably about a trillion species that's more than the estimated number of stars in the milky way where are all those species and what are all those species and if we look at this pie chart so this is the proportion of all the species on the planet here you go you can see that 50 percent are insects that's half of all the species half of those trillion species are insects and then 30 percent three out of every 10 are crustacea and these are just all the little crabs and things and little critters with with um um um, um uh shells on their back and here you have the next biggest one is the chelicerates, and they're all the scorpions and the spiders and the mites and the ticks and sometimes not very nice for humans. And that's probably that's that's well over 80 percent of all the species. And we've got nowhere close to thinking about, well, what about the elephants and the and and and, and the dogs and the cats and the cows and the humans? Well, here, if we look at the mammals, these are the these are the, the all the warm blooded mammals. And here they are, this tiny, 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 thin red line. And you can see that this is all mammals, including humans. Um, and we're, we're kind of in terms of the, all the species on the planet, we're virtually negligible. Even though we huge, have this huge planet. And you think all these trillion species on the planet. Well, you know, you think you think that humans are making the place crowded enough. But in fact, you're beginning to realize that actually the, the planet is incredibly crowded because humans are making up this tiny, tiny, tiny little proportion. And there's all these kind of trillion species out there as well. And we don't see them. And that's why we don't see them as being crowded. And that's because by far the greatest proportion of biodiversity consists, consists of species that are either too small for us to see or we just don't notice them. So that's what all the species on the planet needs. It's huge. And so when we're looking at biodiversity planning or when we're looking at citizen science or we're looking at monitoring and measuring, you know, it's whatever we're measuring, it's always kind of good to realize that it's only within the context of this vast greater whole. Okay, where does all this biodiversity live? Well, it's a good question. And one teaspoon of good soil contains one billion bacteria, one million individual fungi, hundreds of nematodes, one million protists. A protist is anything that's not fungus, animal, or plant. And you think, hang on a minute, I'm a rational person. I kind of reason things out. I think things through. How can possibly one teaspoon of soil contain all those organisms? You know, they'd all be bumping into each other or sitting on top of each other or eating each other. You know, it's, it's almost impossible. But you begin to see that actually the vast majority of these are probably a thousand times smaller than the naked eye can see or 10,000 times smaller than the naked eye can see. And that little teaspoon of soil to a tiny, tiny, tiny little organism is a huge, great environment. Another example is in the ocean in terms of this kind of the big concentrations of biodiversity and there's approximately 230,000 known species and at least 2 million more in the ocean that remains a total mystery. You know, we're up on Mars, we're helicopters on Mars, and we have absolutely no idea what we're living alongside. And in fact, 86% of the Earth species and 91% of the marine species that estimated have never been discovered yet. So you can see this crowded, incredible environment, this planet in which we live. But that's not more. That definition consists of three parts. And so it's all the species and then it's their homes and environments. So what does a home mean? What does a home mean for a butterfly or a frog or a bacterium even? You know, well, just like we need, we need, we need, we need a home to live in. We need shelter. We need food. We need to be able to make our food there, grow our food. We need, we need to be, we need security as human species, and we also need a home in which to rear our young. So every other creature, whether it be buffalo, um, they they all need pretty much the same thing. 
and trees. Our native trees are one of the best homes um, for the small creatures. And here you can see, this is some wonderful research done in England. And these are just, these figures are just the insects and the lichens. And you can see our native ash trees. They are home to over 1000 insects and lichens. It doesn't even include the mosses and the ferns and the fungi and the birds and the small mammals that like living in and around ash. These are just the insects and the lichens. So you see these, these ash trees, they create this wonderful environment. Everything is conducive for these organisms to live, these creatures to live in. Now, of these associated means that they prefer the ash tree. The ash tree is there, you know, some people might prefer living in Ennis um, compared to the country. You know, these thousand species prefer living on ash to oak. But of these, 40% of these are what are known as obligate, and that means they have to live on ash trees. They can't live without the ash tree. And that means as our ash trees die with ash die dieback disease, those 400 species are at danger of being lost. And this is where citizen science becomes hugely important because it's only through our observations and our recording of our observations that we can begin to see what is happening in our local and wider environment. And then the third piece just around about that definition. So it's all the species on the planet, it's all their homes and environments, and then it's all their interactions and relationships with others. You know, and I remember when I was, when I was about seven, my parents used to send me down to my godfather's farm. He had a little farm down in the southwest of England on the coast. And uh, so I used to go down there every holiday and he'd put me to work. I had all kinds of jobs to do down there. But I remember walking back along the lane one, one evening with him back towards the house and it was it was right in the middle of the country and the the, the lane verge was a mass of thistles like thousands of thistles and there were hundreds of little birds these little birds with gold in them and you know my grand my godfather said he said um he said goldfinches love thistles and uh, true enough all those little birds were goldfinches and they were all on the thistles and that was the first time at that age when I realized that actually, you know, birds aren't just flying about being birds and, and just doing, you know, completely indiscriminate, not really caring, you know, just, just being in the, in the environment. But actually, even birds have preferences. Even birds like some things more than others and they'll go to them. And that was the start for me of, of an interest in the way that organisms interact, particularly plants and insects. And um, 60 years later, um, it's still a subject that completely fascinates me and I've worked on it all my life. So just that little piece, just really to encourage, you know, you can convey a small piece of information to children and it can completely transform their lives. Just as that little piece about the goldfinch and the thistles did for me with my godfather. So that thing about interactions and relationships. Well, here, the grasshopper. Here, look, you can see this is in, these are all in my garden. And, and this is this little grasshopper, and he's just almost completely disguised. Now he has evolved with the vegetation, with the plants around him. So he can change color slightly um, so that he can remain disguised in his environment. Now that's known as co-evolution. That's where native species co-evolve together to become closer and closer in their relationships with each other. And that is one of the most fundamentally important things to understand when you're looking at biodiversity planning. And here, this is a bee orchid. Okay, and this orchid over thousands of years it has evolved, its flower has evolved to look like a bee. And that means other bee bees are attracted to it and insects are attracted to it. Now, that's another example of this, this most incredible, intimate, intricate co-evolution that's happened. And there's more, it's not just the shape of the flower. The flower actually vibrates slightly, which is actually in tune with the bee. But anyway, enough of that. But this is all this process of co-evolution. And here, and this is my favorite example, the birch buff moth. Now, if you can see here, it looks just like a little birch twig. Here's its face, here's its little feet. This is co-evolved with birch over thousands of years. So that's what interactions and relationships with others mean. So just in summary again, then around that definition, all the species on the planet, all their homes and all their relationships, it's the whole thing. 
And another way of looking at it, which is particularly useful if you're if you're work if you're doing biodiversity planning, all the species on the planet, we need food, we need a safe place to live and rear our young, and safe passage, a safe way of moving around. And another way, biodiversity equals the whole complex, intricate web of life. And that's what we know as nature. So that's what biodiversity is. So where to start? This is biodiversity. And now I'm saying to you, OK, I'm wanting to turn you into citizen sciences, citizen science for, bi um, for biodiversity. And you're thinking, where on earth do we start with all that complex world around us? Well, first thing to do is think, why are you interested? You know, why are you here today? What have you, what have you, why have you taken time out, uh, you know, on a, on a Wednesday afternoon to talk about citizen science? Well, it could be because you're, you're, you know, you're, you're involved in a community, you're involved in biodiversity planning for a part of your community, and you want to find out what you've got. You may be, you may be working with children and you want, or you may have children, you want to instill a spirit of inquiry and adventure. And there is no better way than introducing children to nature at an early age um, to turn them into, into considerate, thinking, patient, observational people. You may be involved in a school green flag programme. You may, like myself, just like to sit quietly in nature, but to be able to know what I'm seeing, to be able to interpret what I'm seeing. You might be wanting to get a job, you want to might be improve your CV, you might want to travel, but have some tools in order to, so that you can travel and you can, you go with knowledge um, at your fingertips, not just completely ignorant. Or you might, might be wanting to help save the planet, you might be recognising that so, so many problems are facing the planet at the moment, and you know that collecting information and contributing that information may be valuable. So there's all kinds of reasons. And for all the reasons, there is an opportunity for you. Okay. Now, some of the main portals, um, some of the main portals for National Citizen Science Initiative. So these are ones that are operating throughout Ireland, some of them across border, some are just within the Irish Republic. Um, and you know, the interesting thing about, about it is that there are so many of them. Um, and I think this is a reflection of the recognition of how important it is to have the public collecting information and making observations. So one of the best websites is the Environment Protection Agency, and well done to them because they used to be an awful stuffy organisation, you know, sort of, it, and, you know, websites are kind of very sort of difficult to, to find your way around them. But this particular part of the website is terrific. And it's on Get Involved Citizen Science. And here they have a whole list of nationwide um, surveys that you can get involved with. So if you like walking along the river on a sunny evening or you live near a canal and you like walking along the canal on a sunny evening, well, a wonderful thing to do is to join the All Island de Benton's Bat Waterway Survey. And you can join this at any time of the year. And the de Benton's Bat is one that is its protected status. So, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's the, all bat populations are declining um, and it flies very low over the water. So that's how it's easy to identify. It flies low, it dips just above the surface of the water, picking up insects. And that's how you can recognize it. They provide free training. They provide you with the tools that you need. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to, to enrich your evening walks and also to learn at the same time and contribute. The Irish Whale and Dolphin Group is a terrific group. You know, there's local groups all around the coast of Ireland. You can join one of the local groups and then you can get involved with recording sightings and strandings and and again it's hugely useful information if you're up near the if you're up near the border region in those border counties there's the lake buddies for anglers and actually anglers, anglers are being encouraged to collect information about wind um, wind speed air temperature the amount of algae in the water and so on and so we're able to kind of collect all these pieces of information um, all around the count, the country which is helping us show what's happening to our water bodies um, as the earth warms up then Birdwatch Island, and it's a terrific organisation and some very, very talented um, members. Um, there's a lovely bird count that you can do in the, in the winter. 
And one of the most, one really important thing is, is this alert for trichomoniasis, which is a very nasty parasite that uh, finches get. And so they're having a survey looking to see where this disease is beginning to take hold. Um, we have it in Clare. I've, I've seen finches die of it in my garden this year. And then the Irish Wildlife Trust, loads of different um, surveys to get involved with reptiles, bee identification and monitoring and canal wildlife services. So that's all on this EPA website. All free to join. Some of them will give you free training. Some of them will provide you with the tools. And then the other place, and this is my favourite, um, my favourite resource of all. And in Ireland, I can honestly say we're incredibly lucky because there's nothing equivalent in the UK. And there's nothing really equivalent that I've come across in Europe where data is data about the environment, information about the environment is made so freely available to the general public. Um, and not only is it made available, it's made available in, in an incredibly um, user friendly way. And the National Biodiversity Data Centre is run by three people only. Um, it's always underfunded. And yet it is this incredible, incredible organisation. And really, if you're interested in citizen science, this is your portal. This is where you can find pretty much everything that you want to know. So if you go on to biodiversityisland.ie, you've got the record biodiversity here, Ireland and citizen science portal. Um, it gives you all the information about how to submit records, submit sightings and so on. Um, and several surveys they're running at the moment. One of them is the Irish Hedgehog Survey. You can go out today and, and join that. And, you know, Irish hedgehogs, just like so many other species, in, are in terrible decline because of habitat loss and really useful um, to start contributing that information if you live somewhere where there are hedgehogs. Okay. So there you go. So those are the main portals for the national for this, the, the national initiatives on a, on a kind of national scale. But say, you know, say you're 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 working with your community you're a tidy town or you're a, a community council or you're just a, an interested group. And you care about the biodiversity of your environment and you're wanting to find out more. Um, how do you go about it? Say you're preparing a biodiversity and, and you're wanting to um, find out what you have. Well, huge amounts of citizen science can be just done from your armchair. And there is one really important aspect of this next bit, which I'm going to talk to you about. And that is because, you know, there's many, there's a huge interest now in biodiversity, kind of biodiversity planning. And a huge number of people are thinking that the gardening for biodiversity they think that's what biodiversity means. It's all about gardening for biodiversity. So it's about making wild flower meadows and it's making about pollinator friendly flower beds and so on and so forth and bee hotels and things like this. But really what I want to stress to you today is that's only one part of how we can contribute to protecting biodiversity. And it's really not the most important part. Okay, it's an additional thing, it's a piece that's really good for urban areas, but actually the most important part about biodiversity protection is that we're protecting what we have now, we're protecting the native species, because by protecting the native species, we're protecting our co-evolution, we're protecting our communities of organisms. And if we're introducing species from the outside, those communities aren't intact any longer. Anyway, so here we are. We're wanting to do some biodiversity planning. We want to find out what's in our community already, and we don't even have to go outside to do it. And if we go in, this is National Biodiversity Data Center again, Biodiversity Island maps at the front of it. Okay, and you come into this website. So this is just an example. So here, I just, this is Glynn in County Limerick. It's just an example. So down in the bottom right-hand side, you come up with this page with this map, you put in Glynn County Limerick and Glynn comes up. So here is Glynn. And then down on the left-hand side is, you've got two, two areas which are important. You can play around with all of it, but here you have national grids. Now the whole of Ireland, the, the whole of the UK, uh, we're divided up, it's divided up into, into a grid, which makes it easy to kind of be systematic with data. 
Okay, and the one that we're interested in is a two kilometer grid. And then down here is protected areas, which can actually also be very useful. So we click on national grids and we click on protected areas. And here we are, this is, here's the grid. Okay, so this is two kilometers by two kilometers. Here's Glynn. And then we've clicked on protected areas and hey presto, look, Glynn is surrounded by these sites of European importance. The, the special area of conservation here, which is the Shannon Estuary, and here we have the special protection area, which is also the Shannon Estuary, which is protection for birds. So we know already that this is an important area from a biodiversity perspective. But we're interested in Glynn. So what we do is we, we click on Glynn, and we go into reports. And if you click on this square here, it highlights red. Um, you click here, the two kilometer grid. Here's your area, there's Glynn in there. And you click generate report. And it comes up with this, you download this. And hey presto, this is only part of it. You have a list of all the species that have been documented for that grid. And this means, you know, and this is all the data that people like yourselves have contributed. And this, this is only part of the information, but it immediately tells you a whole lot of really valuable information. It tells you you've got a number of protected species in this area. You've got critically endangered species. You've got invasive species. You've got a good range of um, butterflies here. Okay. Um, and just in summary, you know, some of the species in Glynn are actually very special. So you've got the swifts, these incredible migrants, they fly 8,000 miles every year. The oldest swift in Europe is about 30 years old. It's made that journey 30 times. Very, very endangered now. The red-tailed bumblebee, very endangered. The lesser horseshoe bat and the, and the eel. So immediately, if you're interested in a biodiversity plan for Glynn, just by doing this short exercise, you know you've got the basis of your plan. You know what you're needing to protect. You're needing to look at where the swifts live and how to encourage the swift populations and the bat populations and this little large red tailed bumblebee. This, the little, this little bumblebee loves flowers of all kinds. So that's where you can go mad with your pollinator friendly planting because it will really encourage this one. And with this one, with the eel, it's in the Shannon Estuary and you can go liaising with people like the National Parks and Wildlife Service to get advice as to how you help support that eel. So there you have, you have the basis of your evidence-based um, biodiversity plan, looking to protect the native species um, surrounding you. Now you can find more, you know, if you're, if you're interested in finding out more about a species, you can go into species.biodiversity island. And here I've just used the example as the horseshoe bat. And you have, you have all the maps as to where it occurs. This is where it's found, these little purple squares. And then in these two, there's loads of information about it, everything you want to know. So there you have the opportunity to find out where species live, what lives around you, and then all the information you need to know. So you can look up to find out, well, where does the lesser horseshoe bat? Are we needing to protect the trees or the bridges and the stone walls? You know, so all of this information is giving you that, that baseline for your biodiversity plants. Okay, and then just one other area then in, um, in terms of um, your citizen science, your, your looking at the area around you, okay? Um, it's your grassy areas. Now, I think something like some ridiculous amount, like something 70% of Ireland is, is a grassland habitat. We have more grassland than any other habitat in Ireland, than, than, than any other habitat. So, but is grass just grass? Is grassland just grassland? Or, you know, when you're driving, you do a 30 mile journey and you're passing lots of fields. Are they just all the same to you? Does, you know, is one field just the same as any other field? Well, of course not. And actually, your grassy areas, because they're the dom this grassland is the dominant habitat in Ireland, it's probably one of the habitats that as citizen scientists, so as biodiversity planners, that you're going to want to focus on most of all. And then you say, well, actually, grassland's just boring, it's just for the cows. 
but is it? Well, no. So there is this thing called fossil vegetation classification. And that is identifying several different grassland types, quite a lot of grassland types, actually. Um, and they're characterized by the community of plants and other organisms that live within them. So this is where we're having, we're not just looking at those individual species, we're looking at their homes and interactions. So there are, I'm going to talk about five different ones. So first of all, we have the improved agricultural grassland. This is the rye grass. This is the seeded fields for cows. It's good for cows and no good for anything else. And then we have the amenity grassland. Well, this is where we're using grassland for where there's high footfall, where people, you know, parks and amenity areas where people are walking sports grounds and so on. So there's often lots of fertilizer, there may be herbicide used and so on and so forth. Lots of nutrients from all the people. And then there's the three interesting ones. There's what's known as GS1, this dry calcareous and neutral grassland. And this is actually up in Louth. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a field that Phoebe and I, we did a piece of work, we did a habitat survey here. And, and it's very subtle. You know, you don't have kind of big gary, garish colors in, in the Irish landscape, but it was just full of wildflowers and full of butterflies. And all very, very typical of this kind of free draining, dryish um, grassland communities. And then you have the, what's known as GS2, the dry meadows and grassy verges. And this is where you get a lot of orchids coming in. And here you have the wet grassland. This would be very typical of, of County Clare and Mayo on the West Coast, where you have this high rainfall and boggy, wet, acid soil. So you see, you don't know. When you're looking at the, when you're looking at a, a piece of grass, you might be looking at the park in your community, or you might be looking at your lawn, you know, when you might have resourced, seeded your lawn, but you might be looking at your, the grass in, in your garden, um, or you might be looking at a, a meadow or a field, and actually you're beginning to think, okay, now what is this? Is this one of these rare, increasingly rare, special grassland types? like this one or this one or this one, and you can find out. And this is why I urge people not to go bulldozing into um, biodiversity planning. You know, so many people say, oh yes, you know, we're gonna have a biodiversity plan here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a, a wildflower meadow. And, uh, and this wildflower meadow, in order to make this lovely wildflower meadow, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all that grass out. We're probably gonna treat it with herbicide. We're gonna kill all the grass because we're just assuming that it's nothing, it's worthless. And then we're gonna go and get a nice big packet, expensive packet of, of wildflower seed. And we're gonna sprinkle it there. And we're gonna have a wildflower meadow. And hey, presto, we're gonna have lots of biodiversity. No. Much better to find out what your grassland is first, and then if it has interest, then you protect that. And here, here's a really good example. So this is down in Kilrush, and this is the sports field. And so you see, you have your amenity grassland here, and it is, it's all kept very short because it's a sports field, and there's probably fertilizer put on, there's probably herbicide put on, um, and it doesn't really have much biodiversity value. And it's cut very short here because this is where people walk. But this is just a slight slope. And that's where the mower can't get over it. And just look what you've got. People don't realize, but you've got this really very, very fine example of this GS2 dry meadow and grassy verges. And here you've got the bird's foot trefoil and the red clover, and there's white clover in here down here somewhere. And this is the little yellow clover, and you've got self heal in here, and you've got a whole host of species. And the day I saw it, there were loads of butterflies. Now, you know, are you going to go into that area? and say, okay, biodiversity plan here, let's have a wildflower meadow, let's get rid of all of that, because that's not worth anything. And let's sow our wildflower meadow, or are, we going to, or are we going to actually just protect what we have? And this is where citizen science becomes so important, because if we document this, if we observe this, if we record this and know what's here, not in a month of Sundays are we gonna be going digging it up, because it's so precious. It's a really fine example of, um, of, of this GS2 grassland right in the middle of this sports field.
So Ireland's grassland meadow landscapes are incredibly subtle. To me, they're exquisitely beautiful. Then, but they're not garish. They're kind of quite, everything is quite subdued. And this is a really fine example. Do you see, it's these soft whites and yellows and pinks. It's just this lovely kind of sea of soft and I find tremendously soothing kind of color. It's not this. This is one of these wildflower meadows come from a packet of seed. And this bears absolutely no resemblance to the native Irish landscape whatsoever. And more important is that many of these species, they're not native. They may not even produce pollen and nectar, so they may be no good for the, for the bees and the pollinating insects. And if they're not native, there is a risk they will disperse into the wild and become invasive. No, so always when you're looking at your biodiversity planning, if you're looking at your biodiversity protection, always look to protecting what you have first. And it's only if your environment is completely deprived of biodiversity are you wanting to do things like develop wildflower meadows. So monitoring your grassy areas, there's two really good guides. Here is, this is on the, on the Biodiversity Island website, the Irish Plant Monitoring Scheme, showing you how to make a little kind of one meter square quadrant and identifying and counting the flowers within that. And if you do that once a season, you know, you, begin, you can begin to monitor the changes in populations and you can see whether the actions that you're taking are beneficial or not. This is citizen science at its most powerful. And here, this is gonna be coming out in about a month. It's free, it's from the Department of Ag. It's a book that um, um, Phoebe O'Brien, another botanist and myself are involved in, in producing. And this is a key, this is, the, this is the answer to everybody who wants to be able to identify grass and flowers, but doesn't, isn't a botanist and doesn't know how to. And it's the, it'll be the simplest way of helping you understand whether you have a really positive um, grassland environment that's worth protecting or whether it's actually needs work to restore it. So then just a summary. Um, citizen science is, is, apart from the value of collecting data, of collecting information, um, this, 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 this individual collecting of information for the collective good. And I think that's just, one of the most wonderful aspects about it is that we're all contributing to this whole. And this information is so critical because otherwise we're moving blindly. You know, the, so how can we decide what to do, what actions to take within our environment as the climate changes if, we, if we've got no evidence, if we've got no data to, to help us understand what is happening. So every observation you make every recording you make, every time you teach a child something about the environment, you're doing something incredibly valuable, very, very precious, and actually really critical for our survival as a human species. But it also, citizen science and this monitoring and measuring and thinking like a scientist, it really does, you know, again, just going back to myself as a child, you know, I, I was so lucky to have the, one of these one or two people in my life who kind of showed me what was going on. I had the national, I had the curiosity, but they, it was this kind of showing me this world around me. And it means I've never been bored in my life. You know, I've always had something to it to, to entertain me. Um, you know, my, my, my skills in observation and patience and being able to be systematic and methodical have all gone back to those days of when I was six or seven, um, taking those walks through the fields with my godfather. And you as adults, um, I cannot stress enough how important your role is to kind of impart this to children. Um, so there are huge benefits for the participants. It's not just for children. We all really benefit from it. If you're looking for these national initiatives, 
definitely go into the EPA and the Biodiversity Data Centre websites. They're really useful and they're so that certainly the Biodiversity Island, it's so user friendly, make, make use of it because otherwise we may lose it. And then really just going to take this, go, go back to the next one before, is becoming biodiversity champions for your communities. You're using citizen science to inform your planning. You know, even whether it's just your garden and you're thinking, oh, you know, I want to bring more biodiversity into my garden. Don't do it blindly. Don't just kind of read the textbooks and think it's okay, you know, we're going to have to go and get, buy this from the garden centre and buy this from the garden centre and that's going to, that's going to do it. It's not much better that, that you really focus on all those little native species that you've got there first. Um, okay, and then and that way, you know, then when you, when you know what you have, then you can measure the changes. Um, and all these citizen science portals will help you, show you how to measure those changes. And then you can see whether your biodiversity actions are working or not. Great, okay, that's it, I'm leaving it there. And I hope that was um, useful and interesting for you. I'm just gonna stop sharing. Do you have any questions? Fran, I see there's a couple of questions for you in the chat. Joan is asking, saying, I use the National Biodiversity Centre mostly. Do the different citizen science groups share data? Thank you. Um, actually, that's a really good question. Yes, of course. Yeah, and, and you see a lot of the citizen science information will be feeding into the kind of the central databases of the National Biodiversity Data Centre, for instance. And that information is then being linked to European websites where they're collecting information and the different groups kind of working together. And often you'll find that every couple of years, the EPA might produce a report, um, which is where it's kind of collected all the data on a particular topic and putting it into, at the moment, if you go onto that EPA website, there's one on the, the, the current state of the environment in Ireland. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's it, it, well, it doesn't make easy reading, definitely, but it's quite an important one. But that's collect the, the sum total of all that data. Yeah, good question. Uh, we just have, uh, Neve says, brilliant talk. Thank you so much. And Marie says, this was a really good talk. Plenty of food for thought. Thanks. I completely agree. Marie is absolutely <laughs> a brilliant talk. And, and Fran, your, your passion and enthusiasm just beams through the screen. And <laughs> your story about the thinches and the thistles just made me think about when I was little. Yeah. And like many families, you know, on a Sunday, we'd head out in the old car and we'd go, you know, visit various places. And I remember one time, we were going to some woodland, maybe it was Sandringham or something like that, but there was a guide and you could go on a guided walk. Mm -hmm. And during the guided walk, he said, oh, everybody look at this, this is owl poo. <laughs> and he broke <laughs> up the owl poo and inside mm -hmm. the owl poo were tiny mouse bones. Yeah. And that was it. I've yeah. been forever, that was, that was my, finch and thistle moment and that's yeah. what made me love all nature so yeah, thank you it's, very very much yeah it's 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 those um um and i think we're so lucky in ireland because we're we're still pre predominantly a rural community and although the environment has been really degraded over the last 50 years there's some you know really horrible things since from from when i first came to ireland when i was 18 but um it's it's it's, it's not too late. We still have the wildlife and, and more important, we still have those intact communities, you know, where, where all these native species are kind of working away together. And when we have that, when we have that intact community structure, then we know it's healthy, then we know it's flourishing. And that's why I'm, I'm so opposed to introducing anything which is not native. Um, because it brings so many risks with it. Um, but yes, on that, um, just on the general thing, you know, I'm always happy. Um, uh, Lorna, you're, you know, please do send out those 
I mean, I can send the slides with the um, with those website addresses. Um, you know, you're very welcome. If, you know, it's just a small group. You're very welcome to have my email. Um, I'm sure I say I know some of you. I can recognise. Um, and uh, you know, so um, do you can stay in touch. And uh, if you have queries and questions around um, sort of the biodiversity in your communities, um, then I'm always be able to be pleased to help you um, in terms of what citizen science initiatives might actually help get you going. Yeah. That's brilliant, uh, Fran. Will I put your email address in the chat? Um, yes, do, as long as it doesn't go out to the whole world. <laughs> OK, well, then we won't. Then we won't. Uh, if, if anybody wants to... Uh, a copy of Fran's slides, then what I suggest you do is you email the museum at education, tph mm -hmm. at museum.ie. And I've actually put that in the chat because um, I just wanted to say, I'm sure you did enjoy today's talk because you said so. And just to let you know that we're having a second talk on Saturday. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> That's okay, Fran. Um, it's our second talk for National Biodiversity Week. It's with uh, Janice Fuller. And it's biodiversity for community spaces at 2 p.m. on Saturday. So if you email educationtph at museum.ie before 12 o'clock on Friday, you'll be able to book into that. And we hope to see you there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks very much, everybody. Take so care. So to do good work. And um, thank you very much for, for participating. Bye now. Bye.